Am I on cue? So I'm Dr. Brandy, college professor turned entrepreneur and the founder of Millennial Ventures. My startup story today is going to be all about sacrifice. So I want you guys to go back with me about 30 years. I was about five years old. And have you ever heard of the phrase broke as a joke? That sums up my childhood. <laughs> my mom and I uh, lived together. She was a single mother. And um, we actually shared Happy Meals. That's how broke we were. And like, this is in the early 80s, so they had to have been like maybe a dollar, I don't know. But I remember us sort of going for a special treat on a Saturday afternoon, and I'm like, Mommy, I want a Happy Meal. And she gave me that Happy Meal. What I didn't know was that she was gonna eat half of it <laughs> because that was a treat that we had to share together. And so when I think about my childhood, I was a latchkey kid. I'd come home from school and no one would be there. My mom worked the day shift and the night shift at the hospital. She was a registered nurse at that time. And we had these special things between us that I actually thought were normal. And I didn't realize they were not normal until I got older. One of them was the special knock on the door. This was the knock that all latchkey kids may, may recognize. It's the knock that you, so that you can know that your parent is at the door and that it's not a stranger. So we had this whole like rhythm, like little beat, you know. And if it wasn't the exact beat, you know, I knew not to open the door. It was a protection mechanism, something that my mom did to protect us. Same thing back in the day before answering machines even came out. <coughs> the phone would just ring and ring and ring. We had a special ring so that when I was at my house by myself and she had to check on me, she would ring twice, hang up, and ring again. That's how I would know that it was her. And if I accidentally picked up the phone and it was someone else, she instilled fear in me that I don't want an adult to know that you're home by yourself. So you have to make sure that you only answer on our special ring. These things that were so fun and different and quirky to me, the only child, but my mom was doing those things really to protect me. I didn't understand why she didn't spend a lot of time with me because she was working. I didn't get why we had a budget for every single thing. I didn't understand and didn't like it when we would buy food when we had money, right? She'd buy a lot of food, multiple cereal boxes, but I can only eat them in order, one at a time. Don't open that second box until we're done with the first box. Everything in terms of my experience growing up was around what we didn't have, what we had to do to survive. At the time, again, I didn't understand it. I didn't see it anything different. It was my normal. But she would say to me, Brandy, Michelle, one day you'll understand when you're a mom the things that you do to sacrifice for your parents. What I'm doing for you right now is something to instill in you a character of someone who you'll be great one day, you'll have things one day, but today we can't have them right now, but you're still okay. And I kind of was like, okay, I get it. It was kind of like, cue the violins, mom, all right. But I still wanted to be like everybody else. And I didn't understand until I had my first child what sacrifice is about. Picture me, I'm about 120 pounds soaking wet, in 2008, I was pregnant, nine months pregnant with my first child. So picture this frame, but 50 pounds heavier, okay? From the back, I still looked like I was, you know, but from the front, it was a, it was a mess, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's Christmas Day, 2008, and this is the day that my first child is due. But it, the problem was she was overdue. So I was at the house trying to figure out ways to get the baby out. We did everything, anything you can Google to try to get the baby out, my husband and I did, but it didn't work. So I went to my last resort, which was call and pretend like something's wrong at the doctor's office. So I called the number, doo -doo 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 -doo. hello, Lincoln All Medical Center, if you know where this is, right, in, in um, Montgomery County. And the first thing out of my mouth, I think something's wrong, I can't breathe, I need to have the baby right away. Well, man, what's going on? Didn't we just see you yesterday? You should be good, you know? And I went through this whole act. It was a full fake. And my husband's in the back, you know, more tears. Right? <laughs> He's prompting me on what to say. And I'm going for it because I'm like, I'm hot, I'm sweaty, I'm fat. And he ruined my Christmas. And sure enough, they said, okay, come in on New Year's Eve. We'll induce you. We'll get the baby out. By that time, I'm so small. The baby was so big, she was over eight pounds. And so what I thought would be an all-natural pregnancy and delivery, I had, I had to be rushed for an emergency C-section. And I was terrified, right? But, but that wasn't really the point that sort of shook my day. It was when they did the C-section, and I remember vividly they took my daughter out. 
and they lifted her up just like, you know, to me it was kind of like the Lion King, like, right, but it wasn't, it was on the C-section table. The doctor lift her, lifted her up and the first thing out of his mouth was not, you have a healthy baby girl. The first thing out of his mouth was not congratulations. The first thing that he said to us was, did you know that your daughter has a cleft palate? Wow. And we said, no, we, we didn't know. And they rushed her off and started tests and that sort of thing. And so my joy and my relief from finally getting the baby out turned into instant fear, okay. partly anger. And by the third day visiting her in the intensive care unit because she needed help with her uh, feeding, I was distraught. Family members were coming by just being nice and saying, wow, she's beautiful. But to me, she was broken. She wasn't perfect. And everything that I hoped would be a big end to a, a happy story was really the beginning of a tough journey. We later found out that my daughter had a different uh, condition and she had multiple surgeries and uh, procedures to help her and she's fine now, thank God. But one of the things that I realized was I cannot be someone who takes life for granted. I have to go out and do what I really want to do. So with the little baby at home, I propped my laptop up and in between scheduling her doctor's visits, I launched my first company. Now, it was an epic failure as most first companies are, <laughs> but I sacrificed in the weekends that I could be away, I was away from my children and I made that choice to really start my business. And one of the things that I thought about in terms of the things that my mom did, she worked really hard, she was away from me, she made those sacrifices, and I had to do the same thing as a first-time entrepreneur. So now, eight years later, as we're sitting here tonight talking about our stories and talking about our why, my question that I ask, and I was thinking about this earlier, is why not? Why not actually branch out and be an entrepreneur? Why not make those sacrifices? Why not stay up late? Why not get up early if that's what you know it's put on your heart to do? Thank you. Thank you.